Can you imagine using an eBay-like service for education? Introducing Odem, an international on-demand education marketplace powered by Ethereum and blockchain technologies. In this first installment of Neocash Newsmakers, I interview Odom Chief Executive Officer, Richard Magul. We also have a brief moment to talk with Chief Technology Mentor, Dr. Adele Alamessery. We discuss the melding of multiple blockchains to create a peer-to-peer -peer education service platform, smart contracts, reputation on the blockchain, and a brick-and-mortar company with six years of experience. Welcome to the show, Richard. JJ, um, thanks for having me on, and, uh, and, and congratulations on your great success with Neocash. Thank you so much, Richard. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your history with blockchain technologies. In the last 28 years, I've uh, been in technology, and I actually go way back to the days of uh, good old CompuServe. So I kind of just got really excited about it, and I grew up in the ranks. And um, during that time, I moved to Silicon Valley. So I, I got involved into the internet age, and uh, it's, it's sort of the same kind of excitement you feel today in the blockchain age. About six years ago, I had a, a couple gentlemen uh, come to me and ask me to invest or help them get some early investment money so they can grow this incredible vision they had. And their vision was to actually help young students in the Cambridge area to learn more about what it takes to be an entrepreneur. So our whole goal was uh, to work with the students and to bring them to the university like Harvard and work with Harvard, Harvard professors, uh, work with area uh, entrepreneurs. We were very successful in running these programs, so successful that international um, tour operators from China came to us, asked if we can provide these type of educations. And from there on, we've been quite busy. So uh, I started early as um, uh, simply a hacker at 14 years old. And then um, I uh, evolved more to love computer science and try to understand it more. So I went to study for uh, uh, electronics and then computer engineering and then computer science, got my PhD in machine learning, artificial intelligence, and natural language processing. And uh, back in 2010, I was uh, doing research in trust and how do you create a trust network. And that w was kind of like without me knowing is the inception of me uh, really falling in love with blockchain because uh, blockchain is a trustless network. The trust is built into the network. So that's what makes it very interesting for me is how do you create an environment where you don't need to trust the people working with it, but simply it's built within the conditions, within the contracts. Yeah, it sounds like you, uh, you're you well, well knowledge as far as the internets and uh, <laughs> the series yeah. of tubes. Um, <laughs> What, what is ODEM in general, and what problems does it solve? It stands for On-Demand Education Marketplace. Over the six years, some of the problems that we've seen just doing international trade in the education industry, we saw that there was a big mess in the supply channel uh, delivering education. So for us, as a facilitator of these education programs, we found that working with other uh, middlemen has really complicated uh, the industry itself. The international education industry itself is very inefficient, the way um, the program is delivered, and also the cost that was associated when you have a lot of people playing in this uh, in the supply chain. For instance, if a student wanted to come, or a group of students who wanted to come to, let's say, Harvard, for a two-week program in uh, tech innovation. They would have to go through their school, and then the school would go through an independent consultant, an education consultant, and then that education consultant would go in uh, and connect with an education tour operator. And then the education tour operator would uh, contact their counterpart in the United States. And that counterpart would actually connect with us. And then... Uh, we would go and, you know, uh, talk to the educators and all the related services that uh, create the education package. Uh, and then we would have to go back and forth through the supply channel over and over and over again. And what happens is that each of these companies in that supply channel uh, puts in a 25 to 30 percent 
profit on, on the program. So when it gets back to the students, most of them can't afford it. I mean, we were frustrated. We were pulling our hairs out, trying to figure out how to solve this issue. So what we decided to do is build a platform that would remove those barriers and make it more efficient for the student and the professor to be able to connect and work directly together and build a curriculum around their needs and be able to come up with a price that would allow on that student to be able to attend that course. Did you know that there's 93% of uh, students never get to go to college? No, I did that. Yeah. So that's like, that for me, that's mind blowing. Higher education well, higher, is a hot topic uh, with much of the effort put yeah, on the cost and the, the cost. crippling debt <laughs> many students are facing after graduation. What is ODEM doing, uh, aiming to do differently? The United States is carrying about $1.4 trillion in debt. But what I think what we're trying to do is really start focusing on the skills that are needed for these students to learn, but also to be able to get a job. And what we're trying to do is build the ecosystem that includes the uh, corporations, the educators, and the accreditation body to work together to make sure we build the right curriculum, a skill-based curriculum, so that when the students take these credits or these courses, they'll be more confident or more ensured that they will actually get a job. Is ODA an online or an in-class focused effort? We are uh, actually in the classroom programs. And the reason why we're heavily focused on that is because we understand that learning really happens in the class. It's interacting with the professors, interacting with their peers. Uh, we do think online education serves a valuable uh, purpose but more for reinforcing what they've learned in the class. Typically, and I think corporations know this, and that's why they tend to shy away from um, online education, but the, the completion rate for online education is 5%. The completion rate for MOOCs are 10%. Private education are, are fraught with, with fraud. People can actually go online and actually buy a diploma. You know, I, I just I just want to uh, bring this piece up. You know, one of the great things um, is uh, Accelerators, our sister company, uh, has been really well positioned in uh, the developing uh, countries. So uh, we spent a lot last five six years really understanding you know what's going on and understanding that uh, the growth that is happening with the trade with uh, other countries uh, investing into those developing countries. So we see um, a need for the education. I'm really excited about this platform and what it, you know ultimately can offer um, that student. Because one thing is, and every, everybody that works with us, we're 100% committed to the student. So it sounds like you have a lot of experience in the education, uh, both internationally as well as uh, doing what you can locally. Let's let's just talk about the nuts and bolts of the platform, starting out with the token itself. It's an ERC-20 token on the public Ethereum blockchain for your crowd sale. And you have this t token sale going on now. Why, why did you pick the ERC-20 token for that? Well, because of a few technical considerations. So uh, Ethereum uh, provides an environment where it's easier to start the token, it's a well-known system, so the bugs are worked out from the system. We are not the first to use it, so we have examples before us. For, for us, the token is a means to an end. Uh, we are here to uh, basically pursue delivering education for everyone, and we want to use a system that is robust and has been tested before. So that's why we picked Ethereum versus uh, other uh, avenues. And you have a token sale going on uh, right now. Is that right? Yes, we do. And, um, you know, this one is um, we did it really great in the pre-ICO. And um, our ICO uh, launch was on the 17th. And uh, we're doing well. And I, I feel really confident that we're going to reach our hard cap. And I just want to thank everyone um, who is 
who has been a contributor and a supporter on uh, with ODM and our crowd sell, I just want to thank you. Using the the token will give each of the people in the ecosystem the ability to access their own personal information. So what's great is uh, to have that like student data on the blockchain where the students can access it by using the token to make sure that that information is secure, it's transparent to people who they want to be able to see it, like corporations. It just makes the whole kind of uh, ecosystem really accountable to one another. Coming back Coming to accountability, back. And such, is, do you have, you uh, have any uh, sort of know your sort of customer know your requirements for the, the ICO? And- the ICO, uh, we um, have everybody going through a KYC process. Okay. And uh, it's, you know, it's asking for your passport, it's asking for your, your address and the typical KYC information. We want to know our educators. We want to know our students. They'll put additional information. So, for instance, the students will put their transcripts on the blockchain. And then the educators, we want to know who the educators are. We want to make sure that um, they put their credentials into this, uh, into the KYC, uh, or call KYE, know your educator. We really have to create a safe environment for everyone uh, to be able to, you know, work together. I mean, that's, you've heard it, you know, that's one of the, the main things is creating a safe environment for students to learn. So as far as your, your ICO, you said you're going to reach your hard cap. And uh, so or you, you feel like you're, you're confident that, it, that things are going in that direction. Um, yeah, what's the, what is the, the max funding you're, you're looking for? Um, it's, I think that the, it was 11.2 million. And was that in pounds or was that in euros? Euros. Okay. That's right. Um, so that's, I mean, that honestly, that actually stands out because I'm so used to seeing these, uh, ICOs that are asking for a hundred, 150, 200 plus million dollars. Mm-hmm. And then well, it's, it's like, yeah. why, why do you need that much money? JJ, here's, here, here's, I mean, here's why we didn't ask for a lot. We're a, a mature company. We've been around for six years. So we, um, are, we're not a typical startup ICO. We actually have clients. We actually have the resources and, uh, we're, and we also generate revenue. So we have our, uh, business model. You know, we really took a look at what this whole thing was going to cost us. And uh, we brought in, you know, amazing technology team. I think we're up to 10 people now uh, in the technology. Uh, marketing, huge, great marketing team and an operations team. And then we, you know, we got a sales team already. I mean, we have, we have the financial team. So we have all these components together. So for us... It's really just taking what we've done, a brick and mortar, and we're taking it on the pla- into the ODEM platform. Let's talk about the uh, ODEM coordination layer. Uh, your white paper mentions using the Quorum code base to launch a community-driven private version of Ethereum. Uh, you don't want your business bogged down by the, f- by the fire sale of CryptoKitties, is that right? Yes, so... Uh... So we are concerned about the traffic and, and the flow throughout the system as uh, many such other uh, plat- uh, games or platforms would come through. And we don't want to have our uh, users affected by, by those. So we were thinking through how do we divide the entire flow, if you think about it, between what goes on-chain and what goes off-chain. So we would have our own private version uh, running for storage of whatever is not public and hence you can divide the traffic into two portions one that is recorded on the public ethereum network and one that is basically private that we can facilitate the traffic on it much easier you know initially one of the things that we thought we'd do is um, do some on-chain off-chain stuff maybe more of the trans- transactional stuff the money-based stuff that would be more on the public network and then maybe do some off-chain on some of the heavier processing. Because one of the things that we're going to be implementing is the AI t- technology where it actually uh, will understand what the student's needs are and be able to pair the student needs with the right educator. 
And then uh, for payments, and this is interesting. So now we've talked about uh, you're using at least two different blockchains, but now for payments, you're looking at uh, being blockchain agnostic. But you mentioned using Stellar for a settlement. Uh, why did you pick that one, for example? Yeah, you might be familiar that a lot of the banking systems and the fintech are uh, looking at uh, Stellar at the same time to facilitate uh, transactions going across uh, countries and boundaries. And that's the exact reason that we are uh, looking at it. Because as I mentioned, we are trying to use technology that will be adopted by the big players so that our end users can have a very smooth system without having any complications or any uh, new untested technologies being used in it. You know, it's really, again, it's for us, it's go to the market, how fast we can get to the market, okay? We, you know, I've been in software uh, development business for a long time. I've worked with a lot of software companies. I had my own software company. And one thing I've learned after all these years is you can't do everything. And if you're trying to get to the market, sometimes you got to partner with other companies. So you're, you're basically the uh, the interaction between these different blockchains is that is that handled in the coordination layer with your your private version of Ethereum or how is how is that all handled when you're talking between the Ethereum public blockchain your private one and then uh, your different settlements uh, options? Right. So so we call that chain hopping. So basically what. Uh, what happens as a technical aspect is say you have a certain amount of token that wants to move between uh, one user and the other one and um, uh, we would basically uh, create two transactions at the same time one that happens uh, on odem and, and the other one happens on stellar so this way uh, the two transactions conclude at the same time and the, the uh, transaction, the overall result is the value is moved from one place to the other. And then you're also using smart contracts. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. So smart contracts are one of the uh, most interesting parts in all of this because as you are trying to drive value uh, to basically educators and students, you want to guarantee that once an educator puts out an education material, that educator will be compensated for this whenever that material is being used and being credited to a user. And that's where the smart contract comes into play. It will automatically guarantee that the educator will have this uh, compensation credited to them whenever this happens. And similarly for the student, whenever they pay for a course, they will know that they will get the accreditation that they wanted uh, to them as soon as they complete and fulfill the requirements. So it matches a contract uh, very nice. And I think, you know, uh, these these education companies who brings groups of people, they were really going to like it because now they can actually uh, pay for their program and it's be placed in an escrow and release upon the time upon their approval when they actually know they actually got a real life professor. It's not a uh, a student acting as a professor it happens all the time. So the terms and conditions of all the different uh, players in the ecosystem, that's what I love about uh, the smart contracts. What are some of the challenges that you're still working on, for example? So one of the challenges that we are working on is uh, uh, to fine tune the token model, to think through all the aspects of it and how it uh, works, especially in conjunction with the current regulations coming in play. So that's one of the challenges. The other one is in our rollout and how do we basically uh, slowly and gradually uh, roll out networks so that the users can start working through it and looking at it and finally giving us feedback on what they like and not like in the system. Your platform aims to empower students, educators, and service providers. Each can have a hand in creating custom programs. So let's step through that process for a moment and, and explain to our audience what this, this platform can do. Uh, oh, great. Yeah. So starting out, a student, professor, or a service provider registers with your, your platform. And that's, that's kind of where your Know Your Customer, Know Your Educator uh, system happens, right? JJ, uh, just imagine that you were a student and you wanted to, uh, let's just say, uh, learn more about radio broadcasting. Sure. You, you come onto the platform and you know specifically what you want, or maybe you don't. 
<laughs> but you put in your uh, profile, you put in the, what you actually want to learn. And then what happens is that artificial intelligence goes in there and really understands what your, what your needs are. And it automatically peers you to say a professor at Berkeley School of Music in Boston, right? And they connect you. And, and, and there's a professor that actually teaches there, and he's actually on the platform. You guys can connect together, create a, a, a mutual uh, contract to be able to come into a classroom and be able to attend that course. If you decide that that's not the right professor, maybe the cost is too much, what happens is that you can actually send it out to a bid. Other uh, related uh, teachers uh, be able to bid on that price. So what happens is it gives the student more power to actually negotiate their education. And then we go back and we talk about what are we going to do, you know, about the cost of education. Right. So there's, that's a big thing too, that, you know, there's not a lot of negotiations in, in basically anything these days you get, you, or you go to a landlord or a job or whatever, and they tell you, this is the price or this is what you're getting paid. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's people have almost forgotten how to negotiate. So I think this is, this is, (laughs) this revolutionary maybe. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's just think about it too. I mean, because what we're doing is we're, we're making, um, all the resources, all the ecosystem, uh, all the, 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 the service providers and the educators kind of more transparent what they're charging. We're putting it out there. I don't know if you're familiar with TaskRabbit, uh, kind of similar thing, or eBay. So we're, we're, we're kind of like opening it up so everybody sees what's going on and making everybody a little, a little bit more cautious of what they're charging. So now this, this platform can support, you know, any number of various types of programs. And then as uh, the uh, mm-hmm. white paper describes, you can create your own and then see if there's even, you know, see if there's an educator out there willing to fill it or mm-hmm. a service provider willing to fill it. But ultimately, once the negotiations are done, the, uh, the smart contract or the, the terms are, are set and then agreed upon. And then the smart contract is, is built and edu- uh, executed. Right. And then after that, the, the, the student would go to the course, they would uh, receive their education, and then they would finally, the, the final part is uh, confirming that they went to that classroom, that, right. that, they, that, that was in fact you know, what they had signed up for and what the, the terms had stated. And mm-hmm. then the survey, uh, which, which is an important part of this whole thing, is the sort of feedback mechanism, like you mentioned eBay, uh, the rating system is yep. really important. And so this sort of gets into reputation. Um, can you tell me how yep. reputation works with your platform? It gets everybody in the ecosystem the ability to rate one another. That's really important because that information actually is going to be stored on the blockchain. We need that information because uh, it makes everybody more accountable. This is because, you know, one thing is, you know, when you take out the middleman or when you... Um, go around the institutions who have known to be able to govern the education process. You need something, the rating system involved. Right. Because everybody needs to kind of govern each other. So that the rating system will be, you know, always stored uh, on a public blockchain where everybody can uh, see and then keep everybody accountable. There's service fees associated with the education supplier, whoever is providing the classes, and uh, whether it's the, the educator themselves or the, mm-hmm. the uh, education, the supplier, the school, whatever it might be. Um, right. Is this how ODEM makes money and becomes sustainable? Yeah, yeah. Uh, one, is, one of the ways. Um, there's, a couple, there's, a couple, there's multiple ways that we're going to uh, make money. One is uh, um, putting a transaction cost on the uh, educators or the service providers that are putting their their uh, are offering their services on the platform. Uh, other is uh, access to for like corporations to be able to come in and access you know that information, find those potential employees. There's also advertising, which you know I tend uh, not to be a huge fan of it, but I think I see some positioning 
um, type advertising, but also I see phasing in down the road some online education as well, some videos. I see uh, augmented reality type classrooms three, maybe you know, two, three years down the road. Now, I guess this is a question maybe a little bit outside the box, so to speak, but are you looking at or thinking about anything below uh, like a college? Uh, for example, um, in other parts of the world, maybe uh, high schools and middle schools aren't so prevalent or available or maybe they're, they're cost prohibitive. I mean, yep. have you thought of, of, of lowering, you know, the, the age at which you're you're targeting to sell education products and whatnot? We work uh, with students uh, from seventh grade all the way through college and after college, all in, in, in you know, executives and people who are, con- you know, continuing their education. So uh, we bring students... Last year, uh, we worked with EF, Education First, and we brought in students from 13 to 16 into uh, Harvard for a three-week program uh, in ESL, um, technology. We bring people in robotics and innovation, that that age group. So we're currently doing that, and we're going to keep doing that because that's a huge, uh, huge growth. In China, right now, um, parents pay 60%, 50-60% of their income, annual income, on their student education, on their, on their kids' education. So, um, uh, and that's growing in other, uh, other uh, countries, India, Indonesia. Um, you know, so yeah, I mean, that we're going to, you know, and we're actually just going to continue to do it and grow it. So you, the, you you mentioned that that you already have a brick and mortars uh, business going now. Is there a headquarters location for Odom, and a, is this a registered yeah. business entity? Yep, uh, we are uh, registered in Chiasso, uh, Switzerland, and we do have an office there. And uh, it's the Ticino province, and uh, we're really excited. We're also uh, probably um, open up an office in Zoo, which is uh, Crypto Valley. And, uh, we also are very interested in opening an office in um, uh, Geneva because um, there's a lot of foundations, organizations, NGOs that are very interested in what we're doing. And um, um, we, that's one of the things that we're going to need to make sure that we work with the governments and uh, uh, the people who have like closer uh, ties with uh these students that need this help. But then there's also like the OSHA training and things like that. Are you looking at also opening yourself up to those opportunities too? Yeah, that's a great, that's a prime market. I mean, corporations um, are, that's one of the things that a lot of corporations, they have to keep up to date. They have to keep their employees certified. Yep. And recertified. So them being able to have an ability to have their uh, employees be able to connect with, the trainers it just gives them another way to to uh, making sure that their students or, or their employees keep up to date with all the training that's necessary and compliant with you know the government's regulations and stuff like that all right well let's talk about that uh, you, you you kept mentioning uh, bringing the product to market and such what's the current status of your 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 platform and your product in the past year what we did was we went back to accelerators and we looked at the whole entire uh, process, you know, from uh, customer acquisition all the way to program delivery. And so we've been working in the past year building this. And now, uh, as we decided to move into the blockchain, we're taking what we built and we're uh, uh, incorporating uh, quite a bit of it into the blockchain. On the other end, uh, operations, um, we are definitely going to need to hire a lot more. Uh, as I mentioned, we're going to be able to create, we're going to need to set up these regional centers, these regional offices with uh, business development, with marketing, with, um, you know, people going out and, and talking to the educators, the uh, students, um, getting uh, these markets ready and understanding what's going on. So then when we're ready, to open up the doors, the markets will be primed to understand what's going on. So we're doing those all around the world. 
So, and, and one one question here that's sort of, I mean, maybe it's the elephant in the room question, and it has to do with the, uh, the financial aid, so to speak. Uh, whenever you mention college, naturally, financial aid is is, mm-hmm. is often talked about in tandem. Um, and this platform, because it's crypto-based, it doesn't seem mm-hmm. like the standard uh, financial aid acceptance type uh, situation. Mm-hmm. Is that is that right? Actually, um, you know, we that's that's been coming up quite a bit, and we understand that there's just unfortunately there's there's just people that just can't afford it. We've been talking to foundations in Geneva and in the Philippines about them contributing to the the token sale and buying the tokens where they can actually give to students who can't afford education. Also, we're talking about uh, creating a, um, a, a scholarship fund so the contributors can actually contribute to somebody else's education. And so you're, you're looking at launching the beta uh, later this year, the beta version, and then uh, after that version 1.0 and then 2.0. Like what's the, when you look at, you know, version 1.0 and version 2.0, just sort of, uh, you know, looking ahead a little bit. What sort of you know technical things do you want to add into that to to upgrade it? So there will be a lot of upgrade. I'm a believer of uh, continuous development. So uh, we wanted to create multiple release points, not simply one version and that's it. But we want to continuously upgrade the network and be responsive to what the actual users would uh, send us as feedback. So we will listen to what they are doing and what they liked and what they didn't. And then we'll basically incorporate all of that in the next build. That's number one. Number two is technology is a living organism. So there are lots of new things that come out, uh, uh, ranging from a different implementations, different uh, uh, outtakes on the uh, block itself, the, uh, the plans, upgrades for Ethereum itself, as well as the upgrades to the technology going from Angular, um, like right now, we are on Angular 5, but there might be other types that will come out from Angular. So we will upgrade to that, both from a technology point of view, from a user experience point of view. And uh, at the end, our goal is to make sure that we are on the cutting edge of technology, what would serve our users' need. With the changes coming about in the regulations and dealing with different governments, and not only that, but you're dealing with, you know, your, your project is across the globe. What sort of technical challenges and, and, you know, roadblocks are you sort of having to overcome to, to meet those regulations or at least to, to protect yourself from any sort of undue liability? So uh, to be frank and honest, the, the biggest thing is for us to get clarity and we wish that we can kind of um, be able of really uh, vetting this with uh, a, a very clear set of regulations that we can say here is one definition or here is the other one so that we can conduct the business. For us, we want to uh, create a software platform that is built on top of blockchain and we want to make sure that we meet the regulations, but it's it's changing and morphing very quickly. So for us, the challenge is to make sure that we can meet them without having to spend a lot of energy and, and, and cost uh, changing as it, it changes. And one day uh, it's considered a security, one day it's considered more of a uh, uh, financial th- uh, transaction or a utility token. So it's uh, a bit challenging to try and keep up with the different definitions that come out and different regulations. Well, thanks so much. I mean, it's, we've covered a lot of information, and uh, you know, I'm sure if people want to f- find out more, they can visit your website. Where, where should people go to, to, to reach out to you and, and learn more? Sure. It's, um, the website is www.odem.io. Uh, they also, we have a, uh, on, on the website, you can also uh, see links to our uh, social media, Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, and the famous Telegram. So, yeah. Ubiquitous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, JJ. I, I really appreciate it. So it sounds like you uh, have a solid concept and more than just a solid concept. I look forward to, to seeing what happens next. Great. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you for watching Neocash Newsmakers, a sponsored interview series. 
If you would like to have your project highlighted in an interview, please contact me at jj at neocashmedia.com. This interview is not an endorsement or investment advice. I make no warranty about the claims or projections discussed in this episode. Please be mindful of any and all regulations regarding cryptocurrency in your particular jurisdiction. Never invest, gamble more than you're willing to lose and always safeguard your digital currency by keeping it a wallet whose private keys you control. NeoCashMedia.com